Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to another episode of Own I Know Methods TV. I am in my basement still, and my head is disappearing because I am in front of a Sosurian sign, a linguistic sign. This is it, the signifier and the signified in a fused relationship in order to make a unit of meaning. I'm turning on my clock, disappearing also into the sign so that we can have a short lecture here on Ferdinand de Saussure and the question of the linguistic sign. This is a monument in the history of continental philosophy, a huge bombshell into the world dropped in the early 1900s um, when Ferdinand de Saussure gave his lectures on general linguistics between 1906 and 1911 in France. So we're gonna get into this. We're gonna do a quick, short, down and dirty description of what Saussure is talking about in these complicated uh, thoughts about the nature of language as a system of difference without positive terms. Talk about that in a second. I'm gonna share my screen so that you can see um, the PowerPoint I made, which is looks like a bunch of doilies. Um, and let me click present and we will get into it. Um, okay, we are talking today about structural linguistics. This is the idea that sees language as a structure of signs or a collection of um, concepts uh, fused to words that creates a kind of system. So what does Saussure say? He says, this is the bombshell, guys, write this down. He thinks that our common sense presumes, and I think this is true, that we have ideas before we have words, that essentially we have thoughts and then we make up names for the thoughts. He says this is exactly backwards. He says, and here's the bombshell, without language, thought is an uncharted nebula. Listen, there are no pre-existing ideas. Nothing is distinct before the appearance of language. In other words, until you have language to put a name to concepts, you have no thought. This is profound in the history of philosophy. This is goes, it cuts against some of our conceptions about the relationship between ideas and names. Um, and I think that this is a big deal. It sponsored what we will call later in the term when we get to Derrida, we get to Foucault, we get to all these famous names in the history of critical theory, the linguistic turn, the idea of seeing language and therefore literature, poetry, and the linguistic question as central to major philosophical questions about what exists in the world and how that set of things changes. So what is the linguistic sign? So Source wants us to think about, he's doing the work of semiotics, which is the study of linguistic signs. What is a linguistic sign? A linguistic sign is a word and a concept fused together. So he calls the word a sound image because he really wants to describe the phonetic quality of this thing. Um, we can just call it a word for now, but sound image and concept, arbor or tree, and then the thing we mean when we say tree are fused together in this semiotic unit, which is called the linguistic sign. So we can, so here's one, which is the word watch. And then this thing that I'm holding or the idea of watch, that's a linguistic sign. So think about that, understand that. Um, here's the deal. What Saussure says about that is that the relationship between this word watch and this thing the concept of watch is arbitrary. We could call this thing a doodad or a ha. And if we all developed in a social form that had it as a linguistic structure, a system that when I said, ha, you knew this, that would work just as well. So the arbitrary nature of the linguistic sign is really critical to this set of ideas that Saussure is leaving us with here. Um, it's unmotivated in the sense that it doesn't have a necessary relationship to the thing itself. We say tree, or in Latin you say arbor, um, but you could say something else. It, but 
he's, he's, this does not mean it's subjective. He says it's, it is not naturally connected, that relationship, but you can't just go say anything you want. It's socially enforced and it is, as he says, develops out of the social relation. So we have systems of differences without positive terms, a whole set of these sound images that essentially work together to make a system that you and I are both speaking right now. Because we live in the same world, linguistic world, we can say these things. And you know that when I say watch, I'm talking about this. And when I go, huh, I'm clearing my throat. That's because in our system, that's what those sound units refer to in their system. So he says, the value of a sign is what it does within that system. So this diagram right here is essentially a diagram, a really, really small language with only three words. That's because what we have is a chain. He wants us to imagine a language as a chain of these semiotic units where one and the other go together. But when I say pen, you know I mean this. And when I say watch, you know I mean this. And our system of language has an almost infinite number of these nouns or concepts that are essentially in a chain. You could imagine a world where this was the name that we call this pen and we call this watch, and it would probably work just fine. That's just not the one we live in. So this system of differences of arbitrary relations is what constitutes what he calls a long, which is a language or a system of these differences. And a parole is the speech act within that. So when I say, this is my watch, that's a parole. A long is the system that lets us talk about those things. Um, so he says, language can be compared with a sheet of paper. Um, and I'll, if we had a real class, I would hand one of these out and we could each make one of our languages, uh, a little private language. Thought is the front and sound is the back. You can't cut the front without cutting the back. In language, you can neither divide sound from thought or thought from sound. So listen to this. You cannot think it unless there's a word for it. If you don't have a, a name for a subtle distinction, digital watch, pocket watch, all you can see is watch. In other words, without a way of drawing distinctions with language, thought is unavailable to you. So think about this, and I want us to kind of like meditate on this really intensely, because when we get to Foucault, for example, who helps us explain the rise of the term and concept of homosexuality, which did not exist until the 19th century, it was an unthinkable idea. There were various practices, there were things people did, but the label of the identity term homosexual came into the grid of language only in the 19th century. It was not possible to be thought in the same way. So this has profound consequences that are social and political in nature, but here it's about theory. So here, for example, in a book by an excellent writer who we're gonna meet later in the semester, uh, Robert McFarlane, he made a dictionary of all the words that we no longer use in English and English adjacent languages like Gaelic. These are all words spoken in the British Isles for landscape that describe in microscopic, in almost impossible detail features of the earth, deep, deep, deeply detailed ideas of how to talk about different qualities of turf that we do not have. Unless you can say these words, unless you know how to differentiate fibrous turf from the other kind of turf, you are only seeing turf. You might not even know what turf is. Then you might just see dirt. Do you guys follow what I mean? So Sewer explains that until we have a name for the grid of concepts, for the concepts on our grid, they are unthinkable to us, invisible. So, Ideas and signs in this way work by negation. They're purely differential. The reason this is watch and this is pen is only because this one is not this one. The sound pen and the sound watch are separable from each other. 
and therefore they work by difference from one another. This means that they are arbitrary on the one hand, they don't have a necessary relationship to their concept, and they're differential. They work based on their function within a system. This is really, really key, and we're going to come back to this over and over again. The arbitrary nature of the sign explains why the social fact alone can create a linguistic system. Our agreement with one another in a linguistic community essentially fixes the linguistic value of what this or that sound image means within the system. We could all get together and decide to say, huh, instead of watch, but I can't do that myself. It, no individual is capable of fixing a value by himself. Um, so this brings us back to the sheet of paper. I can't make you think of watch when I say, huh, that is a social fact that would have to be instituted over time, socially and enforced within a system of differences. So the famous example that everyone thinks of, the kind of cliched example is the names for snow or landscape features in indigenous vocabularies, but I've already given you a concrete example here, and we can look at more of McFarland's examples if you want, but of the perceptual capacity enabled by a richer system of signs. If you and I both spoke a language with 25 units in it, we would not be able to speak in very much detail about the specific qualities of the British landscape. We need a richer, more robust, more diversified set of options if we are to speak with specificity about phenomena that we want to name. So this is about, and so Sewer's twist, why this is a bombshell in the history of ideas, is that it says it's not just that we can't talk about those things, it's that they don't exist to our minds. If you only see dirt, you can't see the various qualities of peat that an Irish um, peasant might have seen in the 18th and 19th centuries. That quality of experience was lost to you. So McFarland's project in this amazing book, which we maybe get to talk about, is to revive a lost vocabulary for perception, to enable us to see distinctions that have essentially, he argues in this book, been lost. That is an example of the Saussurian phenomenon of language as a system of differences without positive terms. Um, we can see Carol many, many, many times playing with these ideas um, when, for example, we have a term, um, a sound image called mock turtle, but there's no thing that that refers to. A mock turtle soup is a thing, but as we talked about in class, that's made out of a boiled hog's head. <laughs> So a mock turtle, while pictured here, is a kind of semiotic joke because it's a sign, it's a signifier without a signified that it refers to. And that's Carol sort of playing with this tricky relationship between um, the signifier, the word or sound image, and the signified, the thing that it denotes or the concept that it evokes in our mind. Mock turtles, uh, we would think it looks like a turtle, but really, um, it doesn't mean anything except for a boiled hog's head. So I bring, I want to leave you guys with, again, this sort of idea that a linguistic system or a long, in Saussure's terms, is a system of interdependent terms where the value of each term is really determined by its difference from the other ones. We'll talk about this more in our, um, in our groups together. Um, I will apologize again for the horrible production value of this video. Watch it on three times speed. There's going to be a small quiz. If I can get it correct, uh, if I can write it onto on the blackboard, do the quiz, come at your right time, read the Saussure again, and we will talk about language and perceptual capacity when we get into our groups. Thanks, guys. See you later.